We were four people at the launch of Le Clip. Six months later in November, we were 50 people and we produced 10,000 watches a day. Welcome to Structural Shifts by Aperture, a bi-weekly show that radically reimagines the future of work, society, and business. We take a devil's advocate approach to exploring the massive shifts transforming our economies and our world. And our guests are not afraid to challenge the status quo. To learn more about Aperture, visit Aperture.co. When it comes to business, are you all about market research or do you go with your gut? For Michel Jordi, it's the latter and following his intuition led him to start five groundbreaking watch companies. Michel is known for shaking things up in a traditional industry through innovative design and enviable marketing. Andy Warhol came to his New York launch party. People Magazine featured Michel on its cover. And the event marketing strategies that Michel used for his launch publicity are still being used today by the best marketers. Today, your host, Ben Robinson, sits down with Michel to talk about his book, Ignite That Spark, 10 Commandments of Entrepreneurship. You will hear all about Michel's fascinating personal story, as well as his advice to aspiring entrepreneurs, including his Lucky Clover framework that will tell you whether your business idea will sink or swim. Enjoy the episode. Michelle, welcome to the podcast. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. I'm looking forward to a great talk with you. So, Michelle, so, so we, in preparation for this podcast, we read your book. We read Ignite That Spark. And, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful book. I mean, you could call it a self-help book for entrepreneurs, but I think it's more than that. I think it's really a celebration of entrepreneurship. And so we're going to talk about this book um, in quite a lot of detail. But I hadn't realized until you arrived this morning that you'd also written an autobiography because my my sort of impression of this book was, is, you know, I loved it. It's, you know, I would advise everybody to read it. It's a very easy, compelling read. But it, the bit that it misses a bit is is your your life story. And then when you arrived this morning, you said, actually, I've got this massive tome, <laughs> which is my autobiography. And so if you don't mind, can we start there? Can we start with just... A little bit your background, how you entered the watch industry. You know, you did your first startup at 23 in Japan. How did you end up in Japan? So, if you don't mind, could you give us a bit, kind of, you know, fill in the gaps on Ignite That Spark and tell us, you know, how you started in this industry and, you know, why you were in Japan in the first place? And, yeah. Um, yeah. That sounds, sounds interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, life is a journey and uh, it's a learning process. We learn every day. And uh, I've been a very, very curious person, enthusiastic, loving life. Actually, when I grew up, my dad had an eight to five job, you know, leaving every morning at 730, uh, coming home uh, for a one hour lunch break and you go back to work until 5 p.m. And when I saw him, actually, my dad was my first role model, the perfect example of what I really did not want to do with my life. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it sometimes happens, like the antithesis of what so, you want to become. I mean, I decided right there in my teens, this is not what I'm going to do. I want to be independent, to break free, to be my own, my own boss, and planning my day. This was really my goal. Fortunately, I had, I had a fantastic mother who, when I was uh, uh, 18 or 19, she, she said, you have to go to England, you have to study English, because if you don't speak English, well, ne- you'll never get anywhere in, in your life. So I went to, to England, actually not in London, I was in Leeds, Leeds okay. University, which was great because uh, nobody spoke English. I spoke German or French there, so I was forced, I was forced to speak English every day. And I learned it quite quickly. I must say it's a great language, language of Shakespeare, which I love very much. When I came back, my sister had already moved to Geneva because she wanted to improve her French. And she said, why don't you come down here? So I came down here in, I still remember 16th of April, 1969. <laughs> I ended up and I slept on the floor in my uh, sister's uh, studio. <laughs> that was my first night in Geneva. I immediately once very quickly in a, in a company in Geneva watch factory. For, no, it was the time when the Japanese watches became very strong. Seiko Citizen. Yep. And all their watches had metal bracelets, except the Swiss watch. The Swiss watch, we had only leather straps. And I remember they put me in charge of the purchasing department there at that, uh, at that watch company. And our salesman always complained, always complained that we did not have any metal bracelet. So they told me to seek for metal bracelets. 
So I looked around and I realized that uh, the manufacturer in Switzerland, first of all, there were only very few and very expensive, 50 francs or more a bracelet, metal bracelet. So I looked around and I realized that all these bracelets came from, from Asia, Japan, Hong Kong, Korea. So, so at that point, was the Swiss watch industry losing competitiveness because it didn't have metal straps? Swiss, the Swiss watches, watch industry was in deep trouble, really, right. uh, really threatened by the Japanese watch manufacturers. As I said, Seiko, Citizen, yeah. Ricoh, yeah. Orient, these were the four big ones. But it was not only the bracelets, but technological changes. Yeah. Number one was the quartz watches, yeah. because the Swiss, although they invented the quartz watch, didn't believe in it. The Japanese used that technology and they made the watches always thinner and thinner and thinner. And the Swiss watches were big potatoes, heavy potatoes. Nobody wanted them in the world markets. And in addition, in all those warm and hot countries, humid countries, a leather strap is dead after three or four months. So that's why the Japanese have metal bracelets. Yeah. And I wanted to bring those metal bracelets to the Swiss watch manufacturers as well. So I left for Japan. I was, I was 23 years old, made a joint venture, was my first startup at age 23. And I arrived in Tokyo, I remember, I had 10,000 Swiss francs in my pocket. And they knocked on the door of the biggest metal bracelet manufacturer in Japan, 3,000 people. And I remember, as if it was yesterday, the guy, the president of the company, the chairman of the company, he received me there. I explained to him about my dream, what I wanted to do. He did not even let me finish my sentence. He just came out and said, Jordi son, <laughs> you must have a big dream. And so he told me, look, I mean, if you don't uh, have big dreams, you never get anywhere. You know, I expected that we would discuss five or 10 year plans. The guy spoke of the 21st century and the Silk Road long before Xi Jinping. He said, Jordi, I'm going to make a Silk Road to Europe and you will be my first link. And that's the way it started. The bracelet was my first business. I founded that in 1971. And after about 15 years, I kind of got tired. I mean, business was, was flourishing. We made 25 million Swiss francs in sales with metal bracelets. Yeah. I was the biggest supplier of metal bracelets to the Swiss watch industry. Everybody used my bracelets. Omega, Longines, uh, Tissot, Bon Mercia, everybody. And then Le Clip was my second company. The way the Le Clip came along, I was always looking for new designs for watch bracelets. And I worked with a lot of freelance designers. And one day I came into an office and, uh, of designers here downtown Geneva and there was a drawing of a clock in the shape of a, of a clothes peg. But it's a big clock, those table clocks which you put in, in, in watch stores as an advertising, you know, the, the bigger clock. And when I saw that, that clock, this was in 1985, it was just uh, shortly before the Swatch Watch was launched. Yeah. And when I saw that, I just immediately, it was within one night, it was a spark, really. A spark, I saw the whole business plan, and I, I saw this, instead of a heavy brass clock, I saw that in plastic with colorful, fancy designs and to be clipped on and wear anywhere, everywhere except on the wrist. And so next day I went back to these guys, I bought the drawing for a thousand Swiss francs. And then I developed the whole thing. And that was in September, uh, 1985. The Le Clip was launched, launched June 10th, 86. I mean, uh, seven, eight months later, we were on the market. When did the Swatch watch come? Was that, you said that 82 was- 82 or 83. Okay, okay. So it was, you were riding a 80. wave of- uh, I was, yeah. yeah. I, I saw I was a rider, riding on their wave. It's true, yeah. Yeah, one one of the anecdotes I love from the book is that so you, so you you've you spotted the opportunity to do to, to do something a bit different with the clip, and you got some investors on board, and then those you said those investors became a bit nervous and they wanted somebody some some external party to validate the opportunity, and they called on McKinsey to do so, right? And McKinsey mm. pretty much rubbished the idea, right? Or at least said that. That you couldn't price it at any sort of premium, right? Yeah. And and you chose to just completely disregard the McKinsey um, report and just launch anyway at the price point you'd already thought yeah, was Yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for me, you know, I, I mentioned this in my book, Ignite That Spark. For me, everything starts with a vision. 
And my vision was so clear about this Le Clip watch. I mean, as I, as you said, I took this watch watch as a benchmark, yep. but it was not a wrist watch. And our slogan actually was the watch to be worn everywhere except on the wrist. That was our slogan. And for me, it was clear I had to position it at, at the same price as the Swatch watch, Swatch watch, 50 Swiss francs. Yeah. Not, not 49.95 or 51, it had to be 50, exactly the same thing, with the same very, very trendy, uh, colorful advertising and promotions. And I was just sure of, I, 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 you know, I work a lot with my guts. I listened to my guts. And I had the gut feeling that this was the thing to do. And I put 35,000 watches in production. And at the beginning, the problem was I couldn't find any retailers. Nobody wanted to buy that watch because it is not a watch to sell at traditional watch, watch retailers. Yep. They didn't look at it as a watch. So I went to see department stores. And department stores, they loved the idea because it was colorful. They saw the, uh, the success of the Swatch watch, Swatch watch. And the big advantage you have with the department stores is you get a lot of frequency. People travel yeah. through, yep. you know, they, they just go through these stores. They see it, they look at it. And f at 50 Swiss francs, you are an uh, impulse purchase. But still, my, my two partners, they were afraid and said, Michel, you have to make a market research. So with market research by McKinsey. And the report came out just about uh, a month before the launch. It was devastating, devastating. No one will buy the product. Totally useless. It's a gimmick. Who the hell cares uh, about the watch in a clothes bag? And what is a watch for if you can't wear it on the wrist? And I used that actually as my uh, promotional uh, slogan, the watch to be worn everywhere except on the wrist. There's a great photo of you actually in the book with, where you're wearing it everywhere but the wrist, right? Yeah, that yeah. is actually we made the front of the People magazine in the United States. Wow. Front page. And People magazine, the circulation is three and a half million with 46 million readership. We made the front re front page of, of People magazine. It was amazing. So just for, for those of you, um, what, well, please buy the book, but if you don't, so this is a, this is a photo of Jordan. He's got, he's got watches hanging off his, his mustache, his hair, his eyebrows, his ear, his finger. So yeah, no, it's, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very. Um, yeah. And if you turn the page, you, you, you see, you see Andy Warhol, who came as a special guest for the launch uh, in New York in October uh, 1986. And actually he told the journalist, I'm waiting for Michel to make a version to clip on my contact lenses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that one. Yeah. He so, was a great guy. Yeah. So, so, your, so your lesson from the McKinsey incident, we'll call it that, was that you can put too much stock on by market research, right? You can... You know, it, it, it can it can essentially prevent you from doing what your gut tells you, which and your gut yeah. sometimes is is a better yardstick of what might work than market research. Yeah, for me, I mean, as I, I listen to my gut, everything I do, I listen to my gut, which, of course, it doesn't mean that you, you're always 100 percent right. I mean, there's sometimes, you know, yeah. it, it is a little bit trickier on the, you know, what market research does not do is it does not take into consideration your advertising expenditures and your promotions. And I mean, we sponsored the Montreux Jazz Festival. Yeah. We had an advertising budget of a, a, a million Swiss francs in 1985 or 86. That was a hell of a lot of money. We had uh, commercial TV commercials, billboards, and the Montreux Jazz Festival. And people just loved the product. I mean, it was just, uh, it was an instant hit. It took off like a rocket. We sold 1 million watches for 23 million Swiss francs in the first year. I mean, imagine that's almost 2 million per month yeah. for a startup in which McKinsey did not, or, or the report, they, they did not believe in the product at all. We were four people at the launch of Le Clip. Six months later in November, we were 50 people and we produced 10,000 watches a day. Wow. Imagine that. I yeah. mean, just structure-wise, organizational-wise, I mean, which everything was just so fast. It took off like a rocket. I've never lived, in all of my life, I never lived anything like those first six months. It was just absolutely unbelievable. The sky was the limit, I can say that. And how did that feel? It, it felt fantastic. It was so motivating. It was actually uplifting. You know, you were like on a, how shall I say? 
like on a cloud, you know. He was just running through the world on a cloud. It was unbelievable. Because um, one, one of the things I also liked about your book, which uh, resonated with me, was, you, I mean, it was, it's obvious from you talking about your dad's life story that you wanted something that was in opposition to that rigid corporate life. Mm. But then what you say in the book is that as an entrepreneur, you feel the high so much more, and the, but also the low so much more, right? And so I can just imagine how it felt to, well, exactly. to first of all, prove all the naysayers wrong and then yeah. to get something out there where you're producing, you know, a thousand watches a day and everybody 10, wants 000. it. Sorry, 10,000, sorry, uh, 10,000 watches a day and everybody wants it. I mean, I can just imagine how that felt. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, the department stores like uh, Grand Passage here in, in Geneva or uh, Globus in Zurich, they have to empty their cash registers, you know, on big days, Friday, Saturday, they have to empty them three times a day. There was so much cash that you couldn't put the cash <laughs> yeah. anymore. At that time, you didn't pay by credit cards, you paid cash. You yeah. Know? No, it's wonderful. And so, so you, I guess also you were very much part of the renaissance of the Swiss watch yes, industry at this time, right? Yes, of course, right? yeah. yeah. Which, as I said, was initiated by the Swiss watch, Swatch watch, and this came along, you know, it was in the same trend. And so you talk a lot about, you know, in this story, in the book, you talk a lot about your gut instinct. You, you also have this... Um, you call it a ready, fire, aim, right? This yes. idea that you've got to yeah. get, if the timing's right, you've got to get yeah. something into market and then you can iterate after that. Yeah. But at the same time, you you talk a lot about the importance of writing a business plan, a detailed business plan, you know, documenting the mission, the vision. How do you reconcile the ready, fire, aim mentality with having really detailed business plans? Because it was the one thing where I was, you know, I, I kept reading those two statements in the book and thinking, I'm not sure they're completely consistent. So I just wanted to wonder how you yourself reconciled the, those two. The book is divided into four parts. Part one talks about the lucky clover, yep. which are the first four commandments. And those first four commandments are vision, guts, different, and timing. Yep. And I think these four are so important. And what I'm, tell, what I'm telling all uh, young uh, entrepreneurs is fill this out, that lucky clover, and evaluate it with notes from zero to 10 for, yep. each, for each of the four leaves. If you hit 40, I mean, you're going to have a home run. And that's what we had. In those three companies, I always had 40. And that's why these three companies became international successes. I mean, the clip, the Swiss Cessna watch, the Twins Heritage, they all were 40-point uh, measurements on the Lucky Clover. But if you're below 30, I think you should really worry about what are you going to do as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Then you have to start to measure what is missing, which of the four parts are, 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 are not correct. What, what, what I'm trying to say in this book is because a lot of people say, the business plan is dead. Forget yeah. about the pre-business plan. I think it's totally wrong. Well, what I think is, is it almost impossible to do and what is not right is when people ask you to make sales projections, projections for the next five, three or five years. This is extremely difficult, yeah. especially for a new business. But what is important in writing your business plan is going through the thinking process of your business. It's like what I also explain afterwards in my rainbow target, which talks about marketing, price positioning, and all these different things. It is very important. What, what I said, when you write the business plan, it forces you to go through the thinking process on what of, of your business, and then suddenly you you know you get stuck somewhere. You don't know well. Did I think about distribution? Did you think about marketing? Do you think about point of sale? All these things, you have to think of it. And I, I felt in discussing with young entrepreneurs who always, they say, I have a great idea, I want to do this and this. I said, put it on paper. Yeah. The minute you ask them to put it on paper, they get stuck. They don't know what to write on the paper. That's what I'm trying to say. If you cannot put, on, put it on paper, that means your vision is not clear and it's going to be very, very difficult to reach your goal. Yeah. But then, as I also said, ready, fire, aim means you cannot always get all the parameters 100% or the way you would like to have them because there's some gray zones. You don't know exactly what to do. So there's only, if you want to just, you know, aim all the time, you can aim for, 
for two, three, four years, you never shoot. Yeah. So one time, there, there comes a time, there's a, a certain factor of risk involved. You have to shoot and then aim as you go along. Because then you're really in the real world, you're in the market, and you have to adapt to that market at all times. Markets are changing. That's the only thing which changes all the time is the market. So adapt to it. If you want to be successful and stay in the business, you have to adapt to the market. Yeah, so it's a bit like so Jeff Bezos talks about this idea of having sort of being able to take decisions when you've got 80% of the available That's exactly data. it. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. So what you're saying is a business plan for you is making sure you understand the big blocks that will be needed to be successful. So understanding your go-to-market plan, understanding how you're going to do marketing, distribution, but it doesn't have to be completely precise. And there's no point doing five-year projections because who knows? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Don't agree. No, I mean, as I said, you cannot always have everything right. There is a gray zone which you only know once you're in the market. Yeah. That's why I'm saying then you start to aim. Tell us, tell us a bit more about the um, Swiss ethno watch. Well, as I said, I mean, from Le Clip, the problem with, with Le Clip was it, it, it grew so fast that I just couldn't uh, finance the whole portrait. I ran out of cash. So I had to bring in an investor. And that investor, I mean, I was, I was very naive and uh, believed everything he said and what he did. Instead of taking a, a, a lawyer or an advisor with me to make sure we all, you all do uh, every step properly, I trusted my, my two former partners that they would take care of that, of, of, of that part of it. But instead, they partnered up with the, with the new guy and they kicked me out. So, I mean, a uh, naivete, you know, I concentrated on business, whereas they concentrated on what is the best way to kick him out and so we yeah. can take control of the business, you know? And then, of course, I didn't know what to do. Sorry, I just, you're right. I've, I've, I've missed, I missed an important step, right? Which was exactly this point, which is you lost control of your own company. And I think in, this is, again, one of the lessons you draw in the book, right? Which yeah. is around... Uh, managing cash flow. Yeah. Because it, this is a classic case of you just grew so fast, right? Yeah, that it exactly. puts such working capital pressures on the company that in the end you had to take in ca what we might now call vulture capital, right? You took in capital that came with, you know, with what well, ultimately in this case, really horrendous repercussions, right? So t talk to us a bit about some of those lessons. So, uh, I mean, I think there's a, there's a whole section here. Right, yeah, there's on, a section um, about yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, It's commandment number 10. Yes. Yep. Cash flow. Cherish your cash. Cash is your oxygen. As I said, if you run out of it, you, you, you die, you know. That's not, but again, you know, I went to IMD, I went to Harvard. That is exactly what they tell you everywhere. Be careful, don't run out of cash, grow slowly, and, you know, because if you run out of cash, you may lose control. But with the situation, like, look, I mean, there was just no choice. Yeah, it just went through the wall. So whatever you, you know, you can't stop it. You can't stop it. But then, I mean, maybe today, what I would have done differently, I should have immediately taken my personal lawyer or advisor and make negotiations myself instead of my first partners doing it. Because in the end, they just partnered up, as I said, with the new investor and kicked me out. I mean, the guy promised to invest seven and a half million, seven and a half million Swiss francs in 1987. That was a hell of a lot of money. Yep. He brought two, two and a half million. The rest never came. So I took a lawyer. I started to, to attack him. But I had already lost the majority when the deal was done. I was below 50%. And... He brought only two and a half million. What can he do after it? It was too late. I couldn't come back. So, I mean, I was kicked out. But as I said, you know, in hindsight, you're always smart. You know what you should have done differently. I just had to acknowledge this, that this was one of my learning curves, one of the things which did go wrong, but I knew should have been done differently. But I can also say that had there not been Le Clip, there would never have been a Swiss ethno watch. Yes. Because I could do the Swiss ethno watch with all the lessons, everything I learned from that first experience. And so, so talk to us then about the ethno watch and what, well, first of all, where the idea came from, how you executed the idea, 
what you did that was different from the clip? So, so building on the learnings from the clip. Well, first of all, the, the clip sold at 50 Swiss francs. It was a fashion watch, plus watch, fashion accessory, wear everywhere except on the wrist, whereas the Swiss Ethno watch was a classical wrist watch to wear on the wrist with a leather strap. But what I did differently because I made a, after the clip, I made a trip around the world to see former friends, to get ideas, brainstorm, what should I do next? Because the one thing I knew is, I mean, I was devastated. I lost my ground. I had a family to feed, I had two kids, you know. And I knew only one thing, that I wanted to remain free and independent. So no way that I would go and work for somebody else. So I went around the world, saw old friends and asked for advice, what do you think I should do? And several of them said, make your own watch. Why don't you make your own watch? Yeah. And I said, come hell. Who is ever going to buy a watch where it says Michel Chorty on the dial? I just didn't, couldn't, couldn't envision that at this point. I didn't have the confidence to put my watch on the dial. It was my wife, actually, who convinced me, said, you have to do it. She felt it was a, was a great idea. She's Korean origin. She has a big spirit and uh, she kind of can think big. After a few months, yeah, I decided, okay, let's, let's, let's have a go. And then these people I met around the world in Singapore and Japan, they said, why don't you make a, a, a typical Swiss watch, like the Swiss army knife? Now, what is so typical about Switzerland? The most typical symbols we have in Switzerland is the cows and the edelweiss. So I took the Swiss, the cow bell, yep. with the belt, which is embroidered. I embroidered the edelweiss on the strap. And the cows went in circle around the bezel of the watch. Yeah, that's exactly it. It was, it was amazing. I think it was an amazing timepiece. But again, you know, pro the problem is when you make a disruptive pro the product, like Le Clipper, also the Swiss Ethno watch, you want to make a market research, you go and meet some people. They all say no. You know why? There are no benchmarks. There are no benchmarks. They cannot compare with, with something existing. So they said, this is a kitschy tourist trap. No Swiss will ever buy that product. Maybe you can find some tourists in Interlaken or Lucerne. Yeah. But I decided to do it anyway. I put 10,000 watches in production before I even had an order. And again, retailers didn't want to buy it. I decided to make it rare and limit distribution to only 100 point of sales. But each one of them had to invest in a package of 100 watches for 20,000 Swiss francs, and I managed to get them together. It was very, very hard work, a lot of persuasion, a lot of traveling. But finally, also, I can say thank to Bucherer, the big retail chain store, Bucherer. They ordered 1,500 watches as a start off. And once I had Bucherer on board, the best retailer in Switzerland, all the others, they followed because they felt if Bucherer says that's fine, it's fine then I think it must be something good. So I, I managed to put them together and we made an amazing launch. I invited them to, 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 to launch the product to the cradle of Switzerland, the Grutli at the shores of Lake Lucerne for an unbelievable launch party for which they had to dress in their Swiss national costumes. They were all motivated and, and joyful. They all went home and said, we're going to spread Swiss Edna fever. And suddenly the product took off. And I can also say one thing is, we spent one and a half million, a launch budget, uh, advertising and promotion budget. If you cannot advertise heavily in promotion, you don't have a chance also to bring the message across. Yeah, yeah. because you're trying to persuade people to, you know, to change their buying behavior. Yeah. Right? It's is, a must. Yeah. You have to make it a must. I wanted it to make it to a must, but I did not sell folklore. I sold lifestyle. Yes. The most important thing was to sell it as a lifestyle product. There's, there's a few things to delve into here, right? So one is um, marketing. Because I mean, you, you, so, you know, I'm a marketer myself, right? And so I loved some of the things you were saying in the book about marketing, because I think, I mean, my, my frustration or my critique of a lot of marketing efforts is they put too much emphasis on just one of the P's, right? promotion. Mm. And what I liked a, a, a lot in your book is you took a lot about the other three Ps. And so, can, and you know, and one of the things you talked about a lot was these launch events and the mm. impact you can have of mm. getting something on the radar of people, mm. you know, of, of the consumer who's time poor, of the publications who yeah. have too, you know, 
are, are stretched in terms of resources. And mm -hmm. so a big launch event can catalyze the the branding and the and the marketing of, of something new so can you can you talk to us about that because i think that again there's a there's a lot on this right in terms of these launch events and yeah it's crucial i think yeah. it's crucial in our success if you only advertise or communicate through classical marketing yeah you have those beautiful pages in magazines but today you go you open a magazine there are tons of advertising yeah, yeah, yeah. tons of advertising also of watches but people don't talk about an outlet. They just turn the page. But when you make a crazy event, like what we did, we made a fashion show at Piccadilly Circus with cows, a Swiss folk group, and Swiss, Swiss uh, and flag a of that as well, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, Piccadilly stood still, you know, and then we made the Swiss primetime uh, evening news. I made a uh, Alpaufzug or a cow procession in, in, at the foot of the pyramids in yeah. Egypt. We took a sailboat up to the Matterhorn, to the foot of the Matterhorn, you know, all those crazy events, what I talk about it. Then what it, what it does is, first of all, it projects the company as being very dynamic, disruptive, unusual. And at the same time, people talk about it. Oh, did you see? Did you see what the guy did? It was cows and edelweiss and, uh, and camels in front of the pyramids or the sailboat uh, at the foot of the Matterhorn. People talk about things like that. Yeah. So you can stretch it for quite a while. And especially also, I always invited my retailers, the network, to these events because I wanted them to, them to be part of it. And very often, we didn't just invite the owners, but the sales personnel. Because suddenly, the sales personnel was there at the launch with the owner of the company, with Michel Chorty. They could talk to him. You know, you have to be very humble in these situations. We're all the same. And, we're, and the retail, if you want to sell something, it's a, it's a long chain. There are many people who are involved and important to sell. And I always say, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And if at the front of the sales point, the sales girl or the salesman doesn't believe in your product, doesn't pro pro propose your product, you're not going to make any sales. Okay, so yeah. that's what I'm saying is when you advertise, the last P, as you mentioned before, yeah. is the point of sale. If when you advertise, you cannot have a really optimal presentation or your product doesn't stand out on the point of sale, you're not going to sell it. And I suppose the, 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 this idea of sort of hacking what we might call it like, you know, you know, hacks or guerrilla marketing or yeah. it's actually become probably more, not less important, right? Because, because we're all on our devices, we're all even more distracted than we were in the past. So it's even harder to get onto the consumer's radar because the consumer is, you know, more attention deprived than ever, right? So, so I think the, the lessons in here are, you know, it's not like because you were launching watches in the, in the 80s that these lessons are not applicable today. I would say they're even more applicable today. And the other thing I liked a lot the, when you're talking about marketing was the importance of price on the one hand, which you talk about, but the other thing was packaging, right? You know, and yeah, not one packaging, of the people. Packaging is very important. Yeah. That's the first thing, you, first contact your customer has with your product is the packaging. Yeah. First of all, you have to stand out. Of course, I, I mean, I'm lucky. I mean, well, I'm a Swiss citizen. What are the Swiss colors? It's red and white, you know? And red is the color of passion and uh, dynamism. So I, I always had, red was always involved in my packaging and everything. So red stands out. My books are red. Yes, that's true. And also the, for the ethno um, watch, timing again was very important, right? Because you, you timed the watch to coincide with the Swiss anniversary, mm, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah again, it's for part of the, I said, the, the, the lucky clover, the four, for yeah. first four commandment. As I said, vision, guts, Different differentiation. Different. If you're not different, if you don't have a USP or a competitive advantage, you don't stand a chance. And then a last of these four is timing. And I realized that all these companies with which have been very successful, the timing was just perfect. And there's a market research by uh, American Venture Capital Group who uh, revealed that 42% of startups fail because of bad timing. And I must say, we have been, sometimes it's, it takes also a portion of luck. I mean, the Swiss Ethno Watch without the 700 years anniversary will probably not, not been as successful as it was. Yeah. Because we got a lot of, 
of write-ups from the press because we linked it with this 700 year anniversary. And if I come back with Le Clip, Le Clip was because I could jump on the band wagon of the Swatch Watch, you know? And then the Twins Heritage, I mean, imagine my third watch, the Twins Heritage. I made Le Clip 50 Swiss francs. The Swiss Ethno Watch, gold plate 395. And then after that, I come with the Twins Heritage. The prices ranged from between 70,000 to 220,000, 225,000 Swiss francs for watches with complicated tourbillon mechanisms. Yes. You, know, you go to any university, any business school, they just tell you this is simply impossible. You cannot, with the same brand, Michel Jordi, or um, Le Clip was different, but Le Clip, then 395, you go up to 70 or 200,000. Everybody says it's impossible. And that's what the press told me. You're crazy. It's um, impossible. You will not be able to do it. You know what? We made a launch event, a fantastic launch event, which a great write, write up in the Tribune de Genève. Production for Twins Heritage was booked out for a whole year with only two weeks after the launch. And we sold over 4 million Swiss francs of watches in the first year. It was amazing. And because it was, again, something different. I just want to go back to the idea of guts, which is one of the four parts of the Lucky Clover. How do you, how do you rank guts? I mean, because clearly you've shown massive guts, you know, putting a 10,000 order for, for Swiss ethno before you'd even had a single retailer prepared to take it, it was, shows massive bravery. But how do you rate guts out of 10? Because I can see how like you could, you know, you can see what's in the market and you get a sense for this is 10 out of 10 differentiated. I can see how you can look at the timing and say, okay, there's something I can hang this on that's some market change or some, you know, uh, or some technological change and that's the perfect timing. I can see how the vision, you could rank out of 10. How do you rank guts out of 10, isn't it? Well, I guess everybody has, has his own way of measuring his gut's capacity or, or whatever. I mean, I, I, I just kind of developed it. Uh, how, somehow I developed this and I was always a very daring. I mean, guts is yeah. a daring courage, a risk taker. I mean, uh, guts has a lot to do with risk taker. I took a hell of a lot of risks in, in my life. It also fell sometimes. I mean, that's why I, fall on my, I fall, fell on my nose. But you know, the good thing about guts, it's like when you, when you eat, you know, sometimes you bite up a little bit too much and you can chew. So you have to work your way through it to, to, to be able to chew it down and digest it. It's the same thing with guts. Sometimes, you know, you, you, you maybe took a, 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 a bite a little bit too big. But it forces you off to find solutions. You yeah. have to, you just have to go. Because giving up is no option. Is, is, this is the, well, my book, actually, the autobiography, the Ruhrschweizer. The English title, actually, is Guts. And the subtitle, giving up is no option. That's the only thing, just Guts. I envision things. I fix myself ob objectives. And then, of course, you have to weigh how far can I go. How, far, how much can I bite up and hope to be able to, to digest? And then you just have to run for it. You just have to work. It's, it's very, very hard work. Okay? And you just don't give up. There's no, no choice. Yeah. And another part of the book is where you were interviewed and somebody said, well, what's your plan B, right? And you said, and you laughed and you said, there is no plan B. <laughs> There's no plan B. So is, is guts almost like a proxy for, you know, just how committed you are to this? No, that's, that's a very, very, very good question. As you say correctly, I have this TV presenter who asked me, what's your plan B for when I start a new company? And I just laughed out. I mean, no. Commitment is 200%. And you never think about the plan B when you start. It's, it, it's impossible. That means you have two business plans. You have one. Yeah. That is yeah. what I want to achieve. And this is what I do when it, when it fails. But you mean, that means that you plan to fail in the, in the first two weeks or, or the first two months. Forget it. Then you better don't start. I mean, when you launch something, you plan to be there at least for a year or two or more, you know? And since the markets are moving so much, 
in six months, one year, two years, the market will be so different, everything so different than when you started on that you cannot foresee what will be your plan B by then. So just focus and concentrate on your success and make it happen. In the book, you rightly point out that the pace of change is accelerating all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, I suppose, a good and a bad thing, right? Because more and more opportunities are opening up for entrepreneurs. And then you say that also sort of coterminously that it's become cheaper and cheaper to launch startups because, you know, the barriers to entry, the, the sort of tech costs and so on of creating a startup are, are falling. So is your advice now still the same as it was? Or do you, or i.e. create a business plan, you know, have, have massive conviction, do the research, understand if it's differentiated, or is it more trial and error now? Would you advise people because, mm. because there's so much change to do more startups, to try more things? Of course, of course. I mean, time is now. I mean, your, your time is now, of course. Things, you cannot stop progress. And we cannot stop where we are moving now. But I think every area, every period has its pros and cons and its advantages. I would say today, it's so much easier to start a company than in my time. First of all, in my time, I mean, it was almost impossible to find money. Uh, we didn't have the same technology. We had no computers. We had no iPhones. We had nothing, no smartphones. Today, everything, all the tools are there. They are at your, at, at your disposal. And also, I mean, in my age, it was a shame to fail. Yeah. It was a real shame. I mean, you know, people looked at you uh, down, you know, oh, look, this guy, he fell. I mean, I, I fell four times, three or four times. So what? I mean, give, give yourself a chance to fail. Because as I said, the most important thing is when you fail is that you learn a lesson every time you fall. And as I said, without a clip, I could never have done the Swiss Ethno Watch. And without the Swiss Ethno Watch, I could not have done the Twins Heritage. Everything became an evolution and was a fantastic learning, learning curve. And what I can say also in hindsight, I don't regret anything. I had a fantastic life. I enjoyed myself. I never looked at my watch. I never felt uh, that I was working. Yeah, as a watchmaker, I never looked at yeah, my watch. Was to read it. I just had, I really had fun. I just lived my passion. And I think that's the most important thing for people live, live in their passion. I mean, you know, life is, is so short and it gives so many opportunities. And also when I mentioned about this, let's say the event marketing and all that stuff, today things have not changed. Event marketing is still there, but it's different because today you have the social media. With social media, you can make so much noise, you know. You have Instagram, you have Facebook, you have all these things. We all, we all didn't have that. So there are enormous opportunities. And what the advice I could give to young entrepreneurs who want to start their own business, start as early as possible. Start in your teens. The greatest thing is the teens, 12, uh, no, uh, 13 to, to 19, because maybe you're still at school, but you can already, you have peers, you have colleagues, do it together with them. You have no responsibility. I mean, uh, family responsibility. You have no kids. And if you, it gives you a chance at 19 or whatever, or 20, you can fail two, three times and you're still young to make it to the next point. And every time you learn something until you, you finally hit the jackpot, which we hope. I think this is, again, a really salient point, which is you make, you talk in the book about always being curious, always learning, which I'd say is, again, you know, a, a universally applicable, probably more important now than ever, right? Because, because the sort of, you know, you talked about your father's life of, you know, a sort of rigid eight to five type setup and you wanting to do something different and be your own boss and so on. But actually almost like the option to have that rigid corporate life is, is disappearing, right? Because I mean, there aren't so many jobs that you can do for your whole life anymore, right? So yes, it's true. almost yeah, like, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, almost like more of us need to become entrepreneurs through necessity than was the case before. And one of your definitions of an entrepreneur is somebody who's just constantly curious and constantly learning. And do you think you can teach that? Or do you think that's just something that's inherent, intrinsic to individuals? I think everybody has to ability to, how shall I say, to cultivate 
that kind of, it's an attitude, you know, it's an attitude to be curious. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so curious. I, I always ask a lot of questions and what, what I can say, I, I want to know more, you know, and I never take no for an answer. I want to know what is behind. And I think today for the kids, they just have to be alert, be alert, be alert, eyes open, ears open all the time and learn. Because in the end, what is important is know-how. We all, through all the experiences we do, we learn a lot of things, which today we call know-how. And know-how is maybe one of the few things you don't learn at a business school or universities. You only learn it by doing. So do it. Break your neck. Stand up and try the next thing. You know, without failure, there will never be any progress. You have to understand, we have to understand that, you know, the Wright brothers, people who start to fly. Yeah, yeah. How long did it take until we could fly an airplane? How long did it take until you, you, you could lift up and fly? How many people's died? I mean, business is unfortunately the same thing, but the damages are not the same because you don't lose your life. Those pioneers, they lost their lives. Yeah. Maybe we should talk about one of the things that didn't work for you, which was uh, the Swiss icon. What was the reason it didn't work from a, an approach point of view? So if, did you apply the same methodology, the business plan, et cetera, to, to that business? Be or was that one where you knew it was riskier because it didn't score so well on the, on the Lucky Clover? Mm -hmm. Talk to it's, us about that. It, it's a, the perfect example. And I think it really rounds up my book. Because if I look at that Lucky Clover, at least two out of the four, four leaves were not optimal. Yes. And number one was timing was the worst time which yeah, you could well, have so done. If you could just elaborate on that. Because so it was like there the, was a crisis, we, we launched right? yeah, it yeah. In, in August 2011. It was exactly when the euro collapsed towards the Swiss francs. And suddenly you could buy Swiss watches cheaper in London, Paris, or, or anywhere in the world because the drop was over 20%. It, it was unbelievable. Yes. Yeah. There, there was even at the point of time, it was almost par. One euro for one, one, one Swiss francs for a couple of weeks or so, yes, you know? yeah, yeah. And so, of course, everybody stopped buying. I mean, I started selling on, only on the Swiss market. I want to concentrate on the Swiss market. They all stopped buying. So timing was definitely very bad. Another thing was differentiation. It was a beautiful product. It still is a beautiful product. I have it on my wrist. I wear it every day. But it was not as different as all my other products. And uh, when it is not that different, then what do you need? You need very, very heavy, heavy advertising. You need a hell of a lot of advertising. And what we did, I had two partners in that company. So what we did when, when the Swiss franc collapsed, we cut our uh, advertising expenditure. Yeah. Huge. We, we, we just crossed and stopped everything. And that was a, a first big mistake. And what we should have done, if you bring your price, you, you, if, if you cut your advertising budget, we should also have reduced the price. Because suddenly that price, 7,900 for a chronograph, would only be paid if you advertise strongly, so people want to have it. But if you, bring, if, if you reduce your communication budget, your price should also come down, your retail. So maybe you should have sold it at 4,900 or, or whatever, or 3,900. We didn't do that. So it was definitely a mistake, misjudgment or whatever. But as I said, I also had two partners. I couldn't do everything. Uh, I mean, the, launch the business the way I wanted to do the business. And then came, came my bicycle accident, a severe bicycle accident, where I lost conscious and uh, just three broken ribs. And I just felt that things were, were going to get very, very difficult and more complex. And I decided in the end, to sell the company to the partners and, and, uh, and get out of it. So was one of your learnings that when you're launching a product, um, a disruptive product, that the advertising budget should never be seen as discretionary because it's just trying to do something really disruptive without the air cover of, mm -hmm. of, of a big marketing budget is, is you know, canoe-like, impossible, would you yeah, say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, marketing expenses, they are very, very important. I mean, you have to communicate. Because the best product in the world 
best product in the world is of no use if people don't know that, that it exists and where to buy it. And why should you buy it? Of course, I mean, you know, there's several ways of marketing. There's also what's important is I always try, try to first have trendsetters to wear your product. Because when you have trendsetters to go around and talk about the world, it's visibility. You need a lot of yeah. visibility. And you can only get that visibility when it's the thing to have, which means you have to communicate. I would say that that trendsetter part is more important now than ever also, right? Because yeah. we live in a world where yeah. branding is so tied to individuals. Because Absolutely. We, so, yeah, having sort of influences where yeah. stuff. Yeah. And when you were... Getting trendsetters to wear this stuff. It was. Did you pay, did you pay for that, or was that just you just created a product that was so desirable that people wanted to wear? No, it? we never paid for it. Yeah. No. That's why I suspected. Yeah. But it was just so good. People wanted to have it, but we made it sexy. Yeah. You have to communicate it, communicate it in a sexy way, and you have to package it properly. I mean, the pro in the end, the product all, all, almost has to sell by itself. When you take it in your hand, there's an emotion going through your, through your body. You feel it, you know. That's the difference, what I'm saying, between a Swiss watch. A Swiss watch has a soul. If I buy a watch made in Japan or in Korea or uh, China, I mean, there's no soul in it. It also gives the time, but there's no soul in it. I mean, look even at the Swatch watch. Swatch watch at 50 Swiss francs. I think it's the greatest consumer product ever made, ever made. Because at that time, when it was, the launch was 50 Swiss francs, what other consumer product gives you technolo technology, precision, mechanics, time and lifestyle for 50 bucks? It's amazing. I think it's a great product, still today. Why do you, why do you say that Swiss watches have sold in a way that other countries' watches don't have soul. It's the way we communicate it, the way we market it. You think it's, yeah, because because I think one of the things that Switzerland does brilliantly is packaging, right? Yeah, I mean, packaging even, even, and, the, and, even and the, communi it's and communication. Package, yeah. It's a communication. I mean, most big companies, they have a great slogan around. I mean, look at the Rolex uh, advertising. It's amazing. So I just want to get you on a couple of other things that you talk about in the book. There's a really nice soundbite where you say talent wins games, but teamwork wins championships. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about the importance of, of building great teams and how you cultivate those teams? I think it's, a, it's, a, it's essential for every company to have a great team. And that's exactly what the slogan you just said, you know, it's a team who wins, cha wins uh, championships, you know, because you know, it's, it's like uh, you compare this with an army. It's no use to be a general and uh, the troops cannot follow him, you know. Napoleon could never have won if the, if the troops were not right behind him. So I think, and in all of my companies, the most important for me was to surround myself with competent people, but most of them also, and you can read them, some of them, they get, I get a lot of testimonials in my book here. Some of my guys, one is now CEO at Rolex Australia. Wow, okay. Another one is CEO at Bucherer in Lucerne. About 10 of them have started their own company. I have regularly contact with them and they, they always tell me, look, Michel, without you, I will never have been there. So, but there's two functions there, right? One is spotting the raw talent. So how, how did you do that? And then the other one is clearly... Empower them. Empowering people. Empower, but empowering people... So presupposes that they're good in the first place, right? So how did you spot the great people? And then we can talk about how you empower yeah. them. You know what? It is very funny and very interesting that I believe that a lot of people have much more talent and much more capable than they think. But you have to give them the confidence. You have to detect and see where the strength is and let them go, let them lose in like horse, you know? I mean, I realized when you let them loose or, or, or ask for them big things to do. It motivates. It's very motivating because, oh, the guy, my boss has confidence in me. He thinks I can do that. I mean, the one who is now in Australia, a Rolex uh, CEO, he was a watchmaker repairing watches at the retail shop in Zurich at the Bahnhofstrasse. And he was about 22 years old or 23. So I said, what the hell are you doing here? 
I mean, you know, as a watchmaker at your age, I mean, I saw that guy had potential. Yeah. And I wanted to have salesmen going out to sell my watches who know what they're talking about, watchmakers. So I took him, I, I, I trained him on the Swiss market, then I sent him with my, my best salesman internationalism to the Middle East to learn about international salesmen. Then I told him, now you go to Hong Kong, you open my affiliate office uh, in Hong Kong. He opened my uh, affiliated office in Hong Kong. He had never made a business plan, nothing. We showed him how to do it. And the guy, was he was 26 years old. He was trembling and said, oh, may I, can I do it, can I do it? I said, you will do it, just go. Throw them into the water, give them a chance, to maybe to, to make mistakes, but you learn from the mistakes. Again, these guys, and they learn to swim. The impression I get when I listen to you is not only were you very much part of and integral to the renaissance of the Swiss watch industry, but also to the longevity of, the, of that renaissance, right? Because of all the people that you, you coached and all the people to whom you gave opportunities. Would you say that's fair? I, I think I'm a, I very, you're a modest man. I'm a very, very small part in that. And in the end, I mean, it's still the guys who have to do the job. But if you come back to Booker, now the guy who's CEO, his second man below is also a guy from me because he was looking for a, for a number two man. And I had him. Also a guy who worked with me in another company, in the Twins Heritage. And he's now, so a Booker and I have number one and number two. Both come, come from my team. So these guys, once you give them the opportunity, they have to see their opportunity. They have to grab it. But very often, as I said, I think a coach's job is to detect, detect the ability, the talent, and give them the confidence to really use up all the, develop all their potential in them. Very often, they don't even know what they're capable of. So develop that potential. The confidence and the opportunity, right? Because yeah, you, you yeah. did both, right? Yeah, yeah. See it. Have your eyes open. Eyes and ears open. And then what about leadership? Because it seems like you were the sort of leader who leads by example, right? Yeah, this is leadership. Leadership, yeah. Show them the example. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for example, you know, I was, most of the time I was the first guy in the office. Most of the time I was the guy who closed the door. But... The, you have to show them how to do it. Get your fingers dirty yourself. But having said that, you also talk about the importance of work-life balance yeah. in, in the book, right? So, I, yeah. So, so live by example, show the level of commitment to the business, but at the same time, what, what would you say also lead by demonstrating to people that they, they can't, the importance of not burning out, of pacing yourself, of, as you say, eating well, mm. uh, living well. Mm -hmm. exercising I never had anybody in my company who had a burnout but I must admit that I have been close to burnouts a couple of times one of them with a clip uh, when I remember I, I arrived once in Vancouver uh, on a Friday night and I stayed in bed the whole week and until Monday I traveled on to to Japan to Tokyo I didn't see anything of Vancouver except the airport I was just so completely dead and tired so you have to listen also to your body when you're down, you're down, then you have to rest. And that's what I learned over time is that when I grew up, it, you were a hero and you wanted to show that you work hard and you work long hours. Today I realize, and that's what I'm also trying to tell people is that the art of doing a good job is of knowing when to relax and when to slow down. So I started to take off long weekends, and that's what I could suggest to anybody. A long weekend, let's say three, four days, is when you're in the 30s or 40s. I mean, it can do wonders in regenerating yourself or, or take a week vacation, whatever. Because when you come back, I mean, your mind is emptied, you know, and you have just so much energy, and it's only good for the company. It's beneficial for the company to take a vacation, to take off. And this is what I think we have to understand. You cannot perform when you're, when you're tired. Health, enjoy life. That's all I can say. I love to drink a good glass of wine and you work like hell during the day. In the evening, a good glass of wine. Hey, what a pleasure. What a relaxation. Talk to us about why you ended up calling it a day. 
when you know when you realized that you didn't want to do any more startups and you know and the conditions that then gave rise to you writing this autobiography which sadly is only available in german right at some point maybe you'll publish the uh, the english version so talk to us about that 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 realization that enough was enough it was now time to take a step back but you know i think life is is like, like i can say the lucky clover the four parts i mean our life is it has also different segments of, of our life there's our youth there's a uh, education then you start to get into corporate life then you become independent as me but then a part of times you know I, i'm 70 70 years old now you know i mean you have to think how much longer you have to go to live you know is it 10 or 20 years if i'm very lucky if god wants it so what do i do with the rest of my life and i think the rest of my life is not going to be behind the desk and and and, and doing operational stuff but coaching people uh, or consulting companies detect talents or detecting opportunities coaches are so important because as i said a lot of people lack the confidence they don't see all their potential and that's what a coach is for and i think if i can help people detect their potential and and live uh, also as i said before a balanced and a rewarding life then i think it's a fantastic way to end the fourth part of my life you know it's it's not i think life is not first of all it's not a 100 meter dash life is a marathon and it's not like a football game where you have two halves i think it's more like like basketball where you have four four quarters or something like this you know so i maybe I'm, i'm now in my fourth quarter and i think there's still a hell of a lot to do and i'm looking forward to it fantastic well that, that's um that's a wonderful optimistic note on which to finish the podcast so michel thank you so much for coming by the book ignite that spark it's um it's full of sage advice and it's really a, a great read you can you can read it in a single sitting so um i think it's also, like a, it's a reference book that you can keep coming back to yeah, is what i think it's yeah. like a bible yeah. you can take it back at any time but also what i said the book costs 19 francs 19 switzerland or whatever about let's say r- roughly 20 dollars what I say to everybody who buys my book, that if you don't get 20 bucks value or wisdom out of this, write to me and I refund it. There you go, you have money back guarantee from uh, the yes. man himself. Okay, thank you so much again, Michelle, thank you. Thank you, it was great. Thank you for listening to Structural Shifts by Aperture. To learn more about us, visit aperture.co. We are strategy for the networked age. Until next time.